centuries ago, the French conservative intellectual Joseph de Maistre recognized that the country can be far more effectively destroyed from within than from without. I've often wondered if things could be any worse in this country than they are, if it was deliberately being destroyed from within. The only conclusion that one can come to is that this is indeed happening. I have been thinking about this for some time. While I can't provide you with evidence of a definite plot, I want to show how various ideas, which have been around for over a century, and which have become very influential within our governing class for the past generation, are having a very malign effect on our country. Every important institution in British society, the law, the police, the civil service, the church, the BBC, the education system, the NHS, all these and many others <coughs> have become infected by radical left-wing ideas. <laughs> but they have gained widespread acceptance because they have been insidiously presented as normal and mainstream ideas from which no moderate person would dissent. And people who hold the ideas we hold are likewise cast as extremists. The process of change has been gradual and incremental, so that people are hardly aware that this is happening. One other institution that has been infected with these ideas, and similarly hollowed out, is the Conservative Party, so-called. <laughs> Traditionally, Conservatives have not been very comfortable with their ideas. They have thus been unable to understand the nature of the forces arrayed against them and have succumbed to the very forces they should be opposing. Even our dear Prime Minister, with his much vaunted first in politics, philosophy, economics, doesn't seem to have much of a clue. What are these ideas? In the late 19th century, the philosopher Nietzsche foresaw what he called a transvaluation of all values. Exactly what he had in mind is not clear. But I interpret it as meaning that the Western world was about to undergo a radical shift in its values. So radical indeed, revolutionary, that what was right would now be wrong, and vice versa. The shift would involve the destruction of the old aristocratic, bourgeois, social and political order founded on the rational, responsible individual who should be encouraged to behave well and punished for behaving badly. Most of the mores, standards, and laws of this order would be ridiculed and subverted. The rule of chaotic Dionysus would replace that of orderly Apollo. In the 20th century, this prophecy was fulfilled. <coughs> to understand what has been happening, we need to examine the ideas of two sets of thinkers, the Frankfurt School, a group of Marxist academics who set up the Institute for Social Research, at the University of Frankfurt in 1924, modelled on the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow, and who emigrated to America when Hitler came to power, and Antonio Gramsci, an Italian Marxist who was imprisoned by Mussolini. The Frankfurt School showed that the class struggle would have to move from the economy, in which it had not been very successful, to the cultural domain. It was they who enlarged Marx's focus on oppressed groups from the working class to racial minorities, women, homosexuals, and other victim groups. And because Western civilization was seen as institutionalizing the oppression of these groups, they wished to destroy it. The various writers attached to the school unleashed a flood of destructive criticism on the main elements of Western civilization and culture. Christianity, capitalism, authority, the family, patriarchy, hierarchy, morality, tradition, sexual restraint, loyalties, patriotism, nationalism, heredity, mm. ethnocentrism, convention, all of which can be seen as components of conservatism. As a way of destroying these things, they advocated, amongst other things, the creation of racism offences, continuous change to create confusion, encouraging the breakdown of the family by inter alia teaching of sex, education, and homosexuality to children, yeah, yeah. undermining of schools and teachers' authority, huge amounts of immigration to destroy national identity, 
promotion of excessive drinking, emptying the churches, an unreliable legal system biased against victims, an excessive amount of dependency on the state, control over and dumbing down of the media. We can all recognise these features of contemporary British society. Needless to say, we can also thank the Frankfurt School for the bane of political correctness, which they spread through the American universities they colonised when they fled Germany. After the Second World War, most of the Frankfurt School returned to Germany, but Herbert Marcuse stayed in the United States and enjoyed enormous influence as the philosopher of the counterculture in the 1960s and 70s. He taught at several prestigious American universities, and it is no exaggeration to say that through his diffused influence, the Clinton and Blair generation and their successors are his spiritual children. Gramsci, the Italian, elaborated on how the class struggle should move to the cultural domain. He realized that the existing order had such a strong hold over people because its values were what he called hegemonic, or dominant. Public discourse was couched in terms which upheld the existing order. For this to be overturned, the left must go on what he called a long march through the institutions. It must infiltrate all the institutions of the state and civil society and infect them with its values. Once it had done this, it could make its discourse hegemonic. This process, which has been going on since the 1960s in Britain, is now virtually complete. As we are now aware, all the institutions of the state, even when the so-called conservative party is in office, and most of those of civil society, have been captured for the left. Last year, the Law Society cancelled a booking for a one-day conference on traditional marriage at short notice because it offended the society's equality and diversity policy. The solicitor's professional body will no longer allow free speech and has no qualms about breaking a contract. Very recently, the Girl Guide replaced the oath to do my duty to God with the ridiculous pledge to be true to myself, whatever that's supposed to mean. This follows the appointment as chief guide of a woman who used to be a leading official of the Family Planning Association, yet another organisation which has deviated from the intentions of its founders, um, who were a group of upper class women who genuinely cared about the fact that impoverished women were having um, large numbers of children that they could, simply couldn't look after. And it's now just become an organ of promoting propaganda for promiscuity. One could give many more examples of organisations which have totally been infiltrated by the left. What are the values of the left? The most pernicious is that of equality. It is no exaggeration to say that it has become the ruling principle of our society. As long ago as 1917, the law laws declared in a case that Christianity is no longer part of the law of England. Ever since, the British state has been searching for an alternative guiding principle. And by the closing years of the last century, it had found it in equality, a value it proceeded to implement with all the intolerance with which one usually associates with a theocratic state. All must now bow down and worship this new God at the risk of losing their livelihood and their property. Nobody in public sector employment is allowed to dissent, and even many of the self-employed are now sucked into this vortex of iniquity. In Nazi Germany, there was a word to describe such forced regimentation, Gleichschaltung. After the enactment of the law allowing so-called gay, so-called marriage this summer, a measure which Cameron proclaimed as one of my proudest achievements. <laughs> Things can only be expected to get worse. Expect to see teachers and other public and perhaps even private sector employees sacked. The government even refused amendments to the bill to ensure that this would not happen. But so exigent are the demands of equality that even reason itself must be shoved aside as we saw from some of the ridiculous contortions the government got itself into during the passage of the bill. In America, there have recently been some very disturbing court judgments on the issue of what is ludicrously known as equal marriage. For the organs of the state to depart from the canons of rationality in an attempt to buttress a flawed ideology is a very serious thing. 
and it's coming to Britain. Equality is certainly not a conservative idea, but the characteristic idea of the left. Of the triad of ideas proclaimed by the makers of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, equality is the only one that does not naturally occur, which is founded on a lie, and which for its attempted realization therefore requires massive state intervention. Whenever you hear the word equality, you know that you are in state intervention and compulsion territory. In case Mr. Cameron has forgotten, the characteristic conservative ideas are order, authority, and liberty to be exercised within a moral context, unlike the liberty of the left, which is uh, just do as you please. Any real conservative abhors the idea of equality. He or she is quite comfortable with the fact that there are differences between people and that it's that to describe these as differences, as inequalities, is to load the argument in a left-wing direction. Yet as leader of the opposition, Cameron offered little resistance to Harriet Harman's Equality Act 2010. He actually voted for it, and the Conservatives did, and was happy to implement it when he became Prime Minister. He had been warned by conservative writers that it was a ticking time bomb of left-wing venom which would enable Labour's purposes to be fulfilled, even if they lost the 2010 election, that would enable them to remain in power, if not in office, but he didn't care. Equality has several facets. The aspect of it which is most pernicious is that which overlooks the difference between good and bad behaviour. If everyone is equal, then who is to judge what is good or bad? It's significant that in the late 19th century, not only traditional social, but also traditional moral categories began to collapse at the same time. Writers like H.G. Wells and G.B. Shaw criticised not only the class structure of society, but also its moral norms, which Marx and Engels saw as inextricably connected. Both social and moral hierarchies were simultaneously threatened. In a socially hierarchical society, it is easier to believe in a hierarchy of value that some actions are intrinsically better than others. This was recognised by William Clark and early Fabian, who in a letter to a friend in 1884, wrote of how Marxist ideologues seemed to desire revolution quite as much for the sake of overthrowing ethics and the spiritual side of things as for the sake of improving the material condition of the people. For Gildwin Smith in 1894, that the family and all its affections are closely bound up with property is evident, and the nihilist is consistent in seeking to destroy property and the family together. Writing in 1899, Jethro Brown regretted the irreverence which has accompanied the pursuit of national equality, and noted that the pursuit after equality often displays a mean envy of every form of superiority. The crusade against class domination tends to develop into a crusade against superior worth. These trends, palpable only to the most acute observers in the late 19th century, became increasingly evident throughout the 20th and have culminated in the morally chaotic society in which we are now living. One of the most powerful conduits through which the idea of equality of worth, and therefore the equivalence of wrongdoer and victim, has entered British society has been the whole system of law enforcement and justice. This would have amazed our 19th century ancestors. Over the past decade, there have been countless stories of politically correct police arresting people who have done nothing wrong and putting them in the cells for several hours while the real wrongdoers go free. The Daily Mail is full of stories like this, but they're never reported in the left-wing press, in the Guardian, in the Independent, who seem to want to deny the reality of the society that their values have created. In many of these cases, the police, once they have gone to the trouble and expense of arresting someone and throwing him in the cells for several hours, have to admit that there is no case to answer, but other cases go further. In so many cases these days, wrongdoers, provided they are not middle or upper class, can expect great sympathy from judges, who as a group seem to have undergone a revolutionary change of mindset. How did this come about? In 1977, the LSE academic, uh, Professor John Griffith, 
wrote a book entitled The Politics of the Judiciary, in which he showed how the predominantly upper middle class background of British judges led them to give judgments that were of a conservative tendency. This was a criticism which echoed that made by Winston Churchill when he was a liberal minister in the early 20th century. Little had changed in nearly 70 years, yet within a decade the attitudes of British judges were about to undergo a radical change. Could I have some water, please? Yes. Our judges still come from predominantly upper middle class backgrounds, but there has been a sea change in their attitudes, and this in itself invalidates Griffith's th thesis, which began in the 1980s, and which was very clear by the 1990s. The punitive attitudes towards criminals, widespread amongst judges, even into the early 1970s, were replaced by excessive lenience. Today, on the rare occasions when the utterances of a traditionally minded judge are reported in the media, one feels as if one has temporarily stepped back into a saner age. From the late 1970s, British law students were exposed to the writings of Ronald Dworkin, professor of jurisprudence at Oxford. In Taking Rights Seriously, another important publication from 1977, the luxuriantly liberal American professor bored on about how the law should take rights seriously by treating everyone with equal concern and respect. None of the traditional loading of the law in favour of the law abiding and the respectable. Mm. Dworkin's idea of taking rights seriously seems to have been to redistribute <coughs> rights from the deserving to the undeserving. The traditional canons of justice were to be inverted. The state was to adopt a stance of liberal neutrality as between law abiding and criminal a neutrality which often looked more like favouring the criminal. It is indicative of how little interest the press has in the power of ideas that when Dworkin died in February this year, I was unable to interest either the Mail or the Telegraph in an article about his pernicious influence on the law. Or perhaps all that shows is how difficult it is to get anything into the papers if you lack the right connections. And now British judges can be guaranteed to uphold the rights of homosexuals who, on latest uh, Office for National Statistics, um, statistics amounts to 1.5% of the population above those of people who believe that homosexuality is wrong. On latest British Social Attitude Survey statistics, about 30% of the population. In January 1911, Peter and Hazel Mary Ball who refused accommodation to a homosexual couple in their B&B &B, were fined £3,600, it's a massive sum, um, by Bristol County Court on the ground that under the Equality Act Sexual Orientation Regulations 2007, it was unlawful for them to discriminate whilst offering the service. Just as left-wingers like to describe capital punishment as judicial murder, I think we can describe this extortion as judicial theft. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever became of the maxim, an Englishman's home is his castle. Even in the privacy of one's own home, the diktat of the egalitarian state will prevail thanks to Her Majesty's judges. Earlier this month, the Bulls appeal, which was rejected by the Court of Appeal in 2012, was heard by the Supreme Court, which has a reserved judgment. I'm not optimistic about the outcome. The homosexual claimants case was brought with the assistance of the taxpayer-funded Equality and Human Rights Commission, i.e. you and me. On its website, the Commission boasts of human rights for all, but it is oblivious to the fact that it is heavily curtailing Mr. and Mrs. Bull's human rights to offer accommodation in their own home to whomever they wish, as Britons have been able to for centuries. The Commission engaged counsel to argue for one view of human rights, a view heavily biased towards the ideas of the left. I come to the conclusion that leftists are not even aware of the fragility of the basis of their so-called human rights. Last year, I attended an event at LSE at which Shami Chakrabarti of Liberty was speaking. I later asked her whether she was aware that the human rights which she saw as taken for granted and objective 
were in fact no more than the distillation of left-wing prejudices. She seemed genuinely surprised. <laughs> Any appeal by the Bulls to the European Court of Human Rights will meet with short shrift. This is the court that decided that a registrar for Islington Council, who had conscientious objections to registering civil partnership ceremonies, had no right to opt out of this work, even if a colleague was available to take her place. In this, it upheld the decision of Britain's Supreme Court. When the Abortion Act was passed in 1967, provision was made to safeguard the position of medical staff with conscientious objections. But that was in 1967, when the British state still respected the claims of conscience. In the Islington case, the European Court held that it was legitimate for the Council to enforce this policy of equality, even if it meant that the woman would lose her job as a result. And this is supposed to be a court of human rights, more like the Court of Star Chamber, which was, in the words of Maitland, the great legal historian, not a court of law, but a court enforcing a policy. And we're back to the days of Star Chamber. <laughs> so how did the European Court of Human Rights become fanatical enforcers of the policy of equality? The problem with the European Court lies not in the Convention itself, which was drafted by the Conservative politician Sir David Maxwell Fife, who later became Lord Chancellor as Lord Kilmuir, but in the way it has been interpreted since the late 1970s. As the 18th century Bishop Hoadley once said, I care not who makes the laws, what matters is who interprets them. A pivotal case was that of Marx in 1979, in which a Belgian unmarried mother challenged aspects of Belgian law which treated legitimate and illegitimate children differently. She argued that there should be no such discrimination. All the judges of the European Court, except one, held in her favour. The one exception was the British judge, Sir Gerald Fitzmaurice. His judgment deserved to be better known amongst Conservatives because it was the last gasp of a traditionally minded judge against the emerging tendency of the European Court of Human Rights to subject the Convention to an interpretation heavily biased towards the values of the left. An interpretation which prioritised the ideology of equality and non-discrimination over that of upholding traditional moral values. Sir Gerald argued that Article 8 of the Convention, which provides that everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and correspondence, was intended to protect a person's home and family from the state's knock on the door in the middle of the night. It was not intended to deal with matters of family law or civil status, as Marx contended, and the majority held. And if Article 8 was inapplicable, then any issues of discrimination under Article 14 of the Convention would not be relevant. Sir Gerald held that the Belgian law was not unreasonable, as it lay within the margin of appreciation that any government should be accorded. States should be allowed to change their attitudes in their own good time, in their own way, and by reasonable means, he said. Furthermore, Breaches of the Convention should be held to exist only where they are clear and not when they can only be established by complex and recondite arguments, at best highly controversial, as much liable to be wrong as right. That's the voice of traditional conservatives <coughs> speaking in the European Courts of Human Rights. But unfortunately, Sir Gerald retired soon after that and he was replaced by... Uh, a judge whose views were far nearer those of the majority in the Marx case. In the majority judgment in Marx, we can see that what had formerly been viewed through the lens of moral right and wrong was redefined in terms of equality and non-discrimination. One of the functions of marriage was that it clearly demarcated between legitimate and illegitimate, and the stigma suffered by the illegitimate was a powerful incentive to marriage, seen as a social good because it evidenced a commitment to each other of people who intended to produce children. But the court did not wish to inquire into the reasons for the taboo on illegitimate birth and its contribution to the stability of society. All it saw was that children born outside marriage were treated differently in Belgian law from those born inside, and that was enough to invalidate the civil status of illegitimacy. The upshot of Marx was that the Thatcher government had no alternative but to abolish the status of illegitimacy in the Family Law Reform Act 1987. Not at all the sort of thing one would expect a Conservative government to do. 
the result has been a near doubling in the proportion of illegitimate, or rather non-marital as we're now supposed to call them, births. It is forecast that by 2016, more than half of all births in Britain will be outside of marriage. It should be noted that the Belgian law which Marx sought to overturn was considerably more onerous than anything that had existed in Britain at the time, but we were nevertheless forced to change our laws too. Here we see the first example of a process that the European Court of Human Rights has set in train on several occasions, the erosion of morals and also of state sovereignty, both for the Belgians and for us in this case. For as long as civilization has existed, there has been a strong link between law and morality until recent times. Societies have recognized that if they want to run smoothly, people should be assumed to be able to make choices, that good should be rewarded and evil punished and that the purpose of judges was to be judgmental. If someone had set out to subvert traditional moral notions, they could not have come up with a better means than the way in which liberal judges have interpreted the European Convention. Yeah, yeah. The ideology of equality leaves no room for the making of judgments about character. Whether people have behaved well or badly is nowhere near as important as whether or not they have been treated equally. To see this in more concrete terms, consider the case a few months ago in which an illegal immigrant who had fathered several children by different women was allowed to stay in Britain under Article 8, Right to Family Life, to be granted to all equally, whatever their nationality, despite the fact that there was no evidence that he had any meaningful relationship with any of the women or children. In a traditional interpretation of Article 8, he would have been given short shrift. As an illegal immigrant, he had broken the law and would be punished for it with deportation. Family life would have been interpreted to exclude anyone outside the bounds of marriage. The idea that a man could advance the fact that he had several illegitimate children as a reason for his being allowed to stay would have been laughed out of court. One of the maxims judges used to employ in interpreting the law was no man shall profit from his own wrong. And the um, way that the European Convention has been interpreted has totally um, demolished all the traditional maxims of English law which were loaded in favour of people who behave well and loaded against people who behave badly. Cases involving foreign terrorists are even more serious. The fact that these are our enemies who aim to kill us is nowhere near as important as the fact that to comply with human rights law they must not be discriminated against on grounds of nationality, and that even if they have been accused of several murders in a foreign country, they cannot be extradited to face justice if there is the slightest possibility that they may be tortured or capitally punished. In January, our borders will be thrown open to millions of Bulgarians and Romanians, among whom there are significant criminal elements. Again, this has to be done to gratify the great god of equality, According to the EU, peoples in any EU country should have equal rights to settle in any other EU country, whatever chaos this may, may cause in the receiving country. One can only hope that this will pro prove the last straw for the excessively long-suffering British people who will demand in such large numbers withdrawal from the EU that even the government will not be able to ignore it. Now that Marxists have been joined by Islamic extremists, Britain has never before faced so many enemies within. And never before have our governing classes been so pusillanimous and so obviously focused on the wrong things, e.g. equality. The imperative to equality seems to underlie most of the things that are wrong with modern Britain. Immigration, foreigners must be treated equally with Britons. Education, the left see the state system as a forum for social engineering. Yeah. Family, recent governments have refused to treat the married family as more important than any other type on the grounds of equality. Crime, criminals and victims must be treated equally. The non-judgmentalism which is so rife in British society has its roots in a radical moral egalitarianism. During the 19th century, Britain's finest hour she was probably a more unequal society than at any time before or since. Some of these inequalities were rightly ironed out, but there has nevertheless been a price to pay for this in terms of loss of liberty of the individual. 
but no attempts by the state to redress what it perceived as unacceptable disparities in the 20th century can compare with the frighteningly totalitarian attitude it has shown in the past few years, irrespective of which party is in power. Freedoms of speech and association are being curtailed. It is impossible to get or keep a public sector job unless you sign up to the ideology of equality and to comply with the Equality Act 2010 most private sector organisations are also becoming infested with equality and diversity officers. Perhaps worst of all, the judges will invariably decide cases involving issues of equality in a way most prejudicial to traditional liberties and traditional moral values. For centuries, Britain's national identity has been inextricably bound to the idea of British liberty and opposition to foreign absolutism and to pride in the fact that the British people have been far more free than they were in more authoritarian European countries. But no longer. Britain is being destroyed from within. People are vaguely aware that there is a lot wrong with this country, but have little understanding of the ideas which underlie the problems. In this talk, I have tried to show, in the limited time available, some of the ideas which are having such a pernicious effect on our country. If we are to recover our national greatness, the great God equality must be dethroned.